the pandemic has been good because I think people have had the time to stay home and then look at their surroundings and be able to appreciate what they have around them. Uh, but now people are aware of the, of the fact that they need the streets to breathe because they're home, they're working from home and they need this environment where they live. Uh -huh. They can go out and get some, you know, get the air someplace else. We're stuck here. 2020 has been a has been a year of years, right? That's highlighted a lot of things that have already been things being, uh, we'll say just for uh, inequity that has always been here. The fight for racial justice and equality is reaching a peak now. Because of what we are recently going through in terms of COVID and, and social justice, um, we will see a lot more positive transformations um, just because people are finally paying attention, you know, and, and they're listening and they're, and they're saying, you know what, you know, I, I, I have been privileged and I haven't realized, um, you know, how difficult it is for some people. And, and I haven't always been open to others, and bringing others in. My partners from Dominican Republic, the other students that I met, the other architects, when they see a voice here, um, in another country talking about how they're planning to change communities, that inspires them. Human, ecological, and animal health are inextricably intertwined. Um, three quarters of the diseases that we all get as people nowadays, including COVID, um, HIV, Ebola, um, three quarters of the communicable diseases we get originate in livestock or wildlife. Um, and that oftentimes is because of crossovers of we're utilizing too much natural space and there's conflict between, you know, there's crossover and spillover between wildlife and people. It's natural systems break down, et cetera. We want to value, you know, everyone's life. Um, I think we, we've been living in a somewhat gilded age, certainly in the last 20 years or so, uh, with some pretty excessive spending. And the fact that uh, computers have allowed us to do some pretty crazy things uh, hasn't always been a good thing. Just because you can do something doesn't mean you should do something. To to speak up when when unjust um, means are, are disproportionately affecting, uh, particularly Black and Brown uh, communities, and and you know we as designers have uh, I think an obligation um, to to do the work that helps undo some of our complicitness in creating in inequities uh, in the in the built and natural environment. And we also have an obligation to teach um, our students, right? Uh, so they can embody in their work how to uh, counteract inequity. This yeah. is the second time that they're trying to come here and do something because they have the money and they have the power and for because of this and this and that and destroy our environment instead of building on it. Like we, we could have more trees here. Sure. Good houses. And why is it that, you know, they could build the, the Rose Canyon the Greenway, huh, which found us and everything. And here we have this horrible thing that, and the more I realize, the more I come around here, I realize that this is really polluting. Yeah. You know, we live right next to a highway. I first started practicing architecture in Lebanon. Uh, this, the idea of, rate, of racial equity was unfortunately it's still not an issue uh, to consider when we approached a certain concept or a certain design. And uh, I guess it's because this issue was not a priority. What's most dangerous for me is uh, the total ignorance that people still have uh, about the whole uh, racial justice subject. I think when I think about equity and inequity in terms of um, public space, that was the, the three main things for me. Access to education, um, the whole issue of who pays for it, and just thinking about our assumptions and making sure that, we, that um, people are represented fairly in the design process. So I believe that equity is what everybody has the opportunity or the benefit of using public spaces and inequity is totally the opposite when you don't feel welcome in a space 
or when you don't feel comfortable while using a space. A lot of discussion is going around now, but I think it's uh, ongoing about the whole notion of equity in public spaces. One of the major shifts I've seen over the years, I think, is the shrinking of public uh, responsibility for public space. And it's partially, I guess, an economic factor, but so often the public now seems to rely on the largesse of developers to handle what should really be in the public realm and in everybody's interest. So when you go into what appears from a design standpoint to be a public space, but if it's managed and overseen by uh, the, the mall owner or whatever, how public is that space? equity of open space, right? I think about even where I grew up um, in Memphis, Tennessee, and then I think about the types of parks, um, if we had parks at all, right, in, in the communities uh, that, we, that we lived in. And so, but then you go to other parts of, of the city and you see uh, these grand green spaces where people are out, outside playing and you, and you wonder, you know, why, uh, why don't we have this? Or why does this look a certain way, this being a park or green space look a certain way in this part of the city and not, in other parts of the city, then you start looking at the relationship of equity and, and power um, to to have a voice, for that voice to be heard. Um, those are all things that, that are that are, I, I think, related. I, I, don't, I don't think you can you can um, separate power and, and equity, um, even if it's the power of governance that things are regulated, or the power within oneself to say, I see something that is not right. When it comes down to equity. It really means that everyone um, is, is fully involved in the process um, and everybody also receives a um, full benefit from the process or the outcome. I, and then I talked to people and they, I said, you know, they, they plan to take a hundred trees and they said, what? <laughs> everybody reacts to it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Everybody, even the cyclists, sure. yeah, they said, no, we can't, we, we're not going to accept this if we're going to take so many trees. My strategy of making the trees be noticed was very effective. I didn't know that this was going to happen, but to put all those trips on the trees worked. And my idea was exactly that. People don't, don't realize that the trees, they don't see the trees, you know? Most of us just walk around and we take them for granted. But if you, if you see what, what that means, a hundred trees, so I first put the, 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 uh, the metallic bands around the trees that were going to be cut straight out. In Dominican Republic specifically, I didn't feel racism as I, I've seen it here. And that's something that I got to realize here. Just because in Dominican Republic, probably, I'm not a person of color because, you know, everybody looks like me. Which is funny sometimes how people, just the way you look, they, they make assumptions of what you are or what you can be and what you're capable of. So one time, uh, I was asked, I was given the task to like make the partition of a housing project for foreign workers. And I was asked to remove the closets from their uh, studio apartments, from their lodgings. And when I asked the reason, uh, the answer was, we need to reduce the cost of the project. Plus, um, their workers from this certain country, they don't need closets even though they were different workers, uh, Lebanese workers in the same lodgings, and they had full closets. This was my first experience uh, that made me feel weird and made me feel uh, that something was not right when approaching a, a small design project. Um, it was uh, the trigger that made me mature throughout my design profession and uh, now I feel like I have uh, matured enough to uh, put the human first in front of every uh, financial aspect or political or economical 
a reason uh, human comfort comes first or shall i say human respect comes first we use engagement because we really are trying to engage with the people and the problems as they are happening together right and i don't think you can you can parachute in and say yes as a landscape architecture student or faculty member or practitioner i know everything about your community and what it can help you i think that the starting point with, with this type of work and what makes a different difference is that you should be listening twice before you draw anything before you put anything on paper you need to go in and meet meet with the people that are actually um, having the lived experience um, that that you know that, that they're living through. I mean, it's just the whole notion of like you know when people talk about communities, this community was very resilient. And, I'm, and our starting point is, well, why did that community have to be resilient in the first place? I need to understand those questions to even understand where they are right now to better understand how we can use our skills as designers to help them solve self-identified community needs. We were asked to come together and um, help design a a park in a community that was deserving of it. Um, and um, underserved community of North Miami uh, did not have open green space. Um, it certainly wasn't equitable in, in terms of other communities nearby. And um, and it was a it was a wonderful journey. I mean it, it really it really started out with something that could have been confrontational and turned into something that was a celebratory process. Caribbean American, African American community, and um, everybody really came together. And one one thing I remember from that process was there was a a young girl in the in these sessions that came up to me and, and said, I, I, "I have to have an orange slide because I love the University of Miami, and uh, they have their, one of their colors is orange." And so we we went through the process, and and I. I we could not forget that, and uh, she got her orange slide. Um, and people said, no, uh, this doesn't make sense, we, we can't do that. Um, we were going to be spending, you know, literally millions of dollars uh, to build something to facilitate somebody in the suburbs getting to their office downtown in 10 minutes faster or something like that, uh, without taking into account the uh, impact that it's going to have on the neighborhood that it has. The fact that a group of people, white and black and Latino, could come together around an issue was remarkable in itself. And I remember uh, making a presentation to then Governor Frank Sargent, who, by the way, trained as an architect. Uh, and we went to the State House to present to him our ideas about uh, an alternative approach, uh, which included relocating the orange line to that corridor. Uh, he looked around the room and saw who was there, and he, he was no dummy. He knew how to count votes. And the fact that this had such a broad uh, coalition of uh, representation there, I, I think resonated with him too, and was important in us uh, being able ultimately to stop the highway. I'd say that it's, it's not exactly landscape architecture oriented, but the current project that I'm running is starting Quaza Craft Brewery here in Kigali, Rwanda. Um, it's the country's first craft beer brewery and it's women owned and led. Our structure in setting the whole thing up, we really want to source from women's agricultural cooperatives, um, both our ingredients as well as trying to do a generative economy and making sure that all of our waste products go back to women farmers for their um, for their cattle, for example, or different different ways to reuse all those resources. Um, so the, where all of our products, we're just trying to think of how many ways can we either train women in, because brewing itself is a kind of a STEM technology, right? There's a lot of engineering, chemistry, math. It's, it's a really intense technical field. And so how do we get women that are interested in those fields to be able to grow within the brewery and same thing to grow their own equity and grow their own wealth and knowledge so that they can go off and and continue or do what they want to afterwards because they will have built that up. The classes that had helped me um, to develop this sustainable and this equity thinking are classes that that I took in Dominican Republic, like, like urban design. I thought that my professors were really talking about how we can help communities. And that's one of the reasons that made me want to, you know, develop my career more into 
landscape and in, into urban design than into just a master's in architecture because they were you know teaching me and letting me know that it's better when we design for people and not just to make um, a building look beautiful and it's just not about um, okay we need things to be functional but are we making things functional for everybody for me the, I guess the way that I that I work and how I approach uh, landscape architecture as it gets mapped onto you know community engagement and then I map leadership on, onto that it's probably from the ways that uh, I was educated at, at the University of Arkansas um, but also you know, the education that I received at Virginia Tech as a, as a master's student and PhD student, but really looking at what was missing too. So it's like you have this, this mode of working that, yeah, you should involve people. And it's so, okay, yeah, that sounds good. But in what ways? Like, what are the methods? Like, how do you actually do that? And then how the next layer to that is how you're actually able to put design and design practice into the hands of the people who probably need it the most. But I realized that for me to have a fuller impact in terms of getting students uh, to think about these issues of you know inequality and how you know a lot of the issues in, in, in that we're facing within in society are not one off, so they're not separate. They're actually really uh, you know, there's a constellation of things that are that are stuck together, right? And you can't always uncouple them. And so you need to start thinking through ways. And I think landscape. You know, our, uh, edu our landscape architecture education is great in the ways that we can show students how to think um, and be holistic in their thinking and then moving towards how to actually solve uh, some of the problems, some of the issues. A word of advice I can sort of put out there for our, our programs is to think more broadly about the, the composition of your, of your, of your faculty and, and the people that you're recruiting. Um, because I think that when we do that, we can reach out to so many more people. Um, there's a major awareness issue as it relates to landscape architecture. And some communities of color, you know, aren't familiar with it. Their parents aren't familiar with, with the profession. Um, they want their um, children to be doctors and lawyers, uh, engineers, and maybe architects. Um, but there's just something about landscape architecture that um, it's, it's truly remarkable. Um, there's something about this profession that allows you to look at the world holistically and understand all these systems that come together. You know, there's social environmental systems that are very complicated. What I like about the education that I've received is that it all contributes to real life because real life is not, you know, a uh, silo. Of this, maybe because I've uh, been living in Boston, which is a racially uh, diverse area. And I guess uh, the big part of it is spending the first year at the BAC. People from different races, from all over the world, students, international students, the faculty, uh, the, the staff, everybody. Uh, we live in such an amazing harmony. Uh, everybody has something new to bring to the table. We enjoy each other and we enrich each other's culture. Making people believe that you can do and you can be an architect, you can be a landscape architect, you can be a designer and you can do great no matter what you are or how you look. They don't think that it's possible. Yeah. They don't think that it's possible. They've been put down so long, for so long. They think they don't think that they have power. And I say, we have power in numbers. It's our tax money. Uh -huh. And uh, if anything, we can try for a democracy. <laughs> but I'm very aware that, that democracy just takes a long time. Landscape architects have this unique place where they sit between architects, engineers, um, ecologists, uh, hydrologists, soil engineers. You know, we, we sit in this unique place where we maybe don't know a lot about each of those fields, but we can see how they fit together and we can make real places and real solutions out of these 
um, you know, complex situation. Um, for me, it really boils down to the process of bringing people together, um, no matter what their background is, what their interest is, what their strengths are, um, and you know what their pursuit is towards um, a place that brings um, people back to the realm of humanity. One that we can all sit in the same room again. <laughs> It'd be nice to be able to do that because we are a social profession. My hope is that maybe this just humbles us some too. Um, the fact that uh, one can't just go away to the Hamptons or something and escape this. This is a plague that could punish all. And um, um, so, for some, you know, on some levels, it, it, it's it's sort of one would say levels the playing field. Um, and so maybe that will make people a little more empathetic to each other. Um, and maybe we'll begin to understand that the public realm is very important. I really, really, really hope that we as a profession of landscape architecture, um, that we stop being shade loving species, first of all, and to get out there and really claim and show the claim to the work that we do. Um, in terms of how we can have a positive change and, and, and how we can incite positive change for uh, communities that we, you know, we can acknowledge our wrongdoings and our complicitness and some of the, the issues with redlining and, and our renewal and stuff like that, but be able to do work that far outweighs the problems that we had uh, in the past. I also think we need to do a better job as a profession to get into communities uh, of color to really show that you know if you care about your community you know you, you, you care about your elders and things like that here's a profession that you can actually do work and have fun and be really creative and, 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 and doing the work but also you can change your neighborhood you can change your community um, we just need to do a better job of, of, of getting out there uh, and doing that work so we should just be doing the work because uh, you know, being communitarian, do it because it's the right thing to do and we shouldn't have to be coerced to do so. I think as designers, we have the power to guide people towards what really matters in life. Like we have the power to guide them on a certain walkway and let them look at a certain landscape and admire a certain natural element. We can guide them to engage together, to be, uh, to live in harmony and to believe that they need each other and that every race and every gender and every color brings something different to the table. With this knowledge that I'm getting right now and while I'm practicing, I can first work in designing for people and then also educate people about it which is the thing that is going to change all. Because if we all think about um, designing for others and not just, you know, to get the, I don't know, the merit that you are a great designer, um, I think that's, that's gonna be beneficial for all.